I'm so distracted that I don't hear the sound of footsteps approaching rapidly. Vil! <laughs> A boisterous pillar of fur and energy comes bursting out of the foliage directly to my right. I jump almost two feet in the air. Hey all you cool creatures. I'm Cryptid. Welcome to the Cryptid Plays YouTube channel. And today we are playing Meeting in the Flesh, which is a horror romance visual novel where we play a character named Vil, who lives in a strange but friendly little city. And while they are friendly with a lot of different people, we get the chance to court one of three different monstrous suitors. And I intend to play today's video as a prologue, and then I will go through one of the suitors' full routes for Valentine's Day. But uh, I guess before we get started, let's get those content warnings. This game features text descriptions and non-explicit visual descriptions of blood, gore, torture, vor, cannibalism, sex, and hand-holding. How scandalous. Obviously, since I am playing the PG-13 version of this, I'm sure that this one won't be... I'm sure it will be a little bit tamer, but without further ado, let's get started. After years of waking up at the same time every day, I've grown far too accustomed to it. I'm awake even before my alarm beetle goes off. Alarm beetle? The air outside must still be cold from the rain last night. The room feels a little chilly and there's strong compulsion to stay curled up in my blanket. My bed is enticingly warm after all, so I decide to remain still until it's absolutely necessary for me to rise. Keeping my eyes closed, I consider what to wear today. The weather today is supposed to be cloudy. Wearing an extra cloak might not be a bad idea, just one of the lighter ones. The alarm beetle starts chirping, and I lay a hand on it before its first trill is over, gently silencing it. I crack my eyes open to squint at the light gently filtering into my room. <laughs> um, technically there is an ending where we don't choose any romance, so I assume choosing all the choices to not see anyone, like taking one more minute would lead us to that, but I am going to go uh, specifically for romance, well, and also the bad ending today for at least one character. So I won't be getting all the choices for everything this time around. Let's get up. I better get up. All right. Let's get going. I crawl out of bed and begin my usual morning routine. It's become such a deeply ingrained habit that I hardly need to think about what I'm doing. I splash my face with water first and wipe off any pus that's accumulated overnight. Why are we pussy? Howling off my face, I return to open the windows and air out the place. The atmosphere outside is crisp from last night's rain. The ground still a little moist, and there's a pleasant miasma that stings at the nose. Poking my head out of the window, I take a few deep breaths to chase off the last tendrils of sleep before withdrawing back inside and making my bed. I find my way to my table to retrieve my usual breakfast, a block of salt and a cup of water. Some people go without eating in the morning or drink only water, 
But I found it hard to last the morning without some salt. The crystals crunch between my teeth as I look for a cloak of appropriate thickness. I assume we are also a monster. The cloak I'm looking for turns out to be abandoned in a corner, and I swallow my mouth full of salt and pull it on. The salt burns down the full length of my throat, and I wash it down with water. That done, I smooth my hands down the front of my cloak to brush off any stray salt crystals and make sure there aren't any unsightly wrinkles. I want to look presentable. Even if I'm just a delivery agent, I still want to look good for my clients. My entire routine doesn't take more than 15 minutes. I've streamlined it well over the years. I glance outside as I close my window. The streets outside are still mostly quiet with only a few people bustling about. The owner of the corner store is quietly sweeping the streets, the rhythmic scratch of brush bristles against the damp dirt echoing down the block. A few crows linger on a nearby roof, muttering to themselves. They seem a bit more excited than usual. My room falls quiet when I close the window. As I leave, I lock the door and jostle it one, two, three times to make sure it's secure. And then I head down the street. The crows bellow at me when I walk past them and I glance up to give them a smile. They remember people's faces, so it's best to stay on their good side if possible. Past them, the sky is a deeper green than it usually is. I squint and shield my eyes as I look up at the suns. That's right, I'd forgotten. The eclipse is in two days. The primary sun looms largest overhead, but its smaller brothers don't lag far behind, the three forming a lopsided triangle. Sounds like a very bright planet. The moon lingers lower down, closer to the horizon, like a pale paper cutout laid against the sky. It's it's normal for them to be scattered like this, but in two days, for just a few moments, they'll all align. The three suns all overlapping at one point in the sky, blocked from our view by one of our two moons. An absolute solar eclipse. Oh, they're cute. Excited about the eclipse coming up. I give a slight jump when a voice chirps from right behind me. I whirl around so quickly I almost end up entangled in my own cloak. Whoa, didn't mean to scare you there. Sorry about that. No, it's alright. I was just thinking about things. One of my neighbors, Agari, from just down the block, she looks more jittery than usual, a string of saliva dribbling down from her mandibles as she also casts her gaze upwards towards the sky. Oh, it's so exciting, isn't it? Just two more days and it will be the eclipse. Are you thinking of doing anything special on that day, sweetie? I smile and shake my head. Nothing in particular. I'm just looking forward to seeing it. Oh, that's also fine. But you should really think hard just in case there is something special you want to do on that day. Well, an absolute solar eclipse only occurs once every century or so. A rare event. I squint up at the sky. Perhaps because of that, people view it as an auspicious phenomenon, 
It said that if you make an important life decision or attempt something new on the day of an absolute solar eclipse, the results are more likely to be favorable. I've never believed in such superstitions, but I know most of the city is looking forward to the eclipse. A lot of people propose to loved ones, explore new areas, or change their jobs on eclipse day. As a result, I've heard it's considered something of a headache for the community organizers who need to deal with the chaos. Still, the excitement building in the air is almost palpable. Regardless of my own beliefs, I don't see any reason to squelch anyone else's excitement. I look back to my neighbor. Do you have any plans for Eclipse Day, Agari? Oh, I do. She gives an excited chirp, clasping her hands together. I'm going to visit my dear friend across town. We had a rather bad fight years ago and haven't spoken since. But we agreed to meet on Eclipse Day to talk things out, and I'm sure we'll be able to rekindle our friendship. Her genuine excitement is heartwarming. I can't help smiling as I give a nod. That sounds wonderful. I hope it goes well. Thank you, dear. Oh, but I shouldn't keep you for too long. You're on your way to work, aren't you? I nod again. It's all right. I always head out early. And it was nice hearing about your plans. Well, good luck on your work. And do think about something to do for Eclipse Day. It would be such a shame to let the opportunity pass by you. I give her a small wave as I turn to leave. And she cheerily returns the gesture. But once I turn the corner, I speed up into a light gallop. Despite what I told her, I hurry a little. I like getting places a little earlier than necessary. Good morning, boss. The air in the salt processing plant stings at the nose, burning at the lungs a little with each breath and I try not to inhale too deeply. Full-time workers here usually wear masks unless they happen to have well-developed nasal filters. Since I'm usually in and out of here, I don't bother with masks. Usually in and out of here quickly, excuse me. Where's your mask? My boss is pretty strict though. It's all right, boss. I'll be out of here quickly. No, wear your mask. You'll need to wait a few moments. He thrusts a mask into my hands before I can stop him, then turns away to a nearby table piled high with packages. I give a slightly exasperated sigh. How many times have we had this exact same exchange before? Although it's a good indicator of how much the boss cares for his workers, I guess. <laughs> we'll pocket it first, but I will just put it on in a bit. The mask really isn't necessary, though. I move to slip the mask into the pocket of my cloak until I realize the boss is watching me. I put on the mask. Okay, what happens if we just put it on? Put on mask. Might as well just put on the mask. It's a little uncomfortable, especially where the filter brushes against the raw sections of my face, but it does immediately make breathing easier. As I adjust the mask strings, I take a cursory glance around the factory. It's a familiar sight, but its internal workings are always fascinating to watch. 
A shoot at the far end of the room belches out spurts of salt crystals, spilling them into a huge vat. The steady hum of grinding and crunching sometimes seeps through the chute, like the sounds of many small bones being chewed up. On the other side of that on the other side of that chute is the machine that processes the raw salt, breaking up any larger rocks into these smaller crystals. The ground up salt needs to be processed further though. The grinding process doesn't get rid of any insects, rocks, or hair clumps that might be present in the raw salt rocks. Workers carry huge buckets of this unprocessed salt to the smaller vats that dot the cavernous room. These vats are constantly stirred with long poles, passing the salt crystals through filters that will catch any unwanted material. The filters quickly clog up with hair and insect wings and need to be swapped out frequently. One vat has a worker carefully adding an enormous bucket of flavoring to it. The scent of honey comes wafting through the air and I inhale deeply. The sweet slick of honey contrasts beautifully to the familiar crisp sting of salt. Honey salt must be delicious. Maybe I'll get to splurge on it someday. But in order to do that, I need to work. What's my quota look like today? My voice comes out a little muffled past the mask. Little more than usual. I step to the table to help the boss load packages into a cloth bundle. Each package is a block of salt wrapped in a tight piece of fabric. The fabric protects the salt from any moisture while it's in transit, and also catches any pieces that might crumble off. Most of the bundles are wrapped in cheap, tan fabric. Those are packages of normal salt. But there are a few packages wrapped in red or yellow cloth, and even fewer wrapped in white cloth. The white ones are... the white ones are mercury, right? The boss grunts in the affirmative. Mercury salt is such a rare treat that I don't deliver it often. That looks like more honey and punishment salt than usual, too. People getting excited about the eclipse, treating themselves. Right. Of course. The boss counts the packages one last time before tying the bundle shut and handing it over to me. There's the rustle of fabric and the crackle of loose salt crystals bumping into each other with each movement. The package weighing heavily in my hands. I tie the fabric tight over one shoulder so the bundle won't come loose or jostle around too much while I'm running. And here's the root. He hands me a scrap of paper with just a few notes jotted on it. I've long since memorized my route, and the paper only notes any exceptions. Who doesn't need salt today? Who's getting special salt instead of the usual? Who's getting, who's getting more packages than normal? Usually I don't need this cheat sheet, but there are a lot of exceptions today. It really does seem like everyone's changing things up in preparation for the eclipse. All the more reason to avoid making mistakes. I'd hate to deliver people the wrong salt and put a damper on the mood. Got it. Pocketing the note, I give the bundle one last tug with my hand to make sure it's in place before turning towards the door. Right before I push the door open, I remember to take my mask off and hand it back to the boss. He gives a snort as he takes it back, waving a hand to shoo me out and on my way. As the heavy door lumbers shut, I hear him call out gruffly, Take care. 
Just a tiny sliver of the plant's interior is visible past the closing door, and I give him a wave of the hand before turning back towards the street. All right. Time to begin my route. I've been delivering salt for several years now, though I was uncertain when an acquaintance first suggested the job to me. I've really warmed up to it since then. The workload is consistent and predictable. My boss is nice, if a little gruff, and the neighborhoods I deliver to are full of friendly people. Hey, starting on your route for today. Yep, have a good morning. You too. My hind claws dig a little into the ground, picking up small clumps of dirt with each step. I quickly fall into a comfortable galloping gait as I take a hard left outside the salt processing plant and start heading down the street. I wonder what we look like, anyways. Huge slabs of buildings loom overhead on both sides. This block doesn't have many residents as it's mostly factories. I pass by those quickly. No deliveries to make just yet, but I do have one delivery to make at the corner up ahead. The building at the very end of the block is smaller, its outer walls off-white instead of a murky beige. It's not very tall either, but it does have an awesome structure sprouting from its top. A giant tower clawing up towards the sky, made of bone and coated with smooth flesh. An enormous pair of antennae protrude from the tip of the tower, their chitinous shells gleaming faintly in the sunlight. They whip back and forth at random intervals, as if raking through the air. The numerous eyeballs at the antennae's base also blink frequently their irises swiveling about to survey their surroundings. One of them whirls around to look me over when I approach, and I give it a small wave. The front entrance to the building has a small sign carved into it. The sign reads, Community Overlook Center. I open the door and enter. The office's interior is much cozier, the air clean and warm. There are a few desks littered with papers, workers busily reading over their contents and filling out other forms. This place always looks busy whenever I come by. Never hectic, though. Despite the steady bustle of productivity, things always seem in control. Not that I know these workers very well. I do wave to a vaguely familiar face, but head straight to the far corner where the tower control pod sits. The pod's nerves crawl up the walls like a giant spider web, the thick cables of flesh burrowing into the smooth rock surface. The pod itself is a giant oblong shape coated in flesh and pulsing gently. The eyeballs embedded into its surface flicker about more languidly, a few of them fixing on me as I approach, though they close wetly after a few moments of staring. They probably don't want to get squished when the pod opens. There's a loud squelch of fluid slick flesh when the pod splits open at the center, its two halves neatly sliding apart like a beetle's carapace. A wall of hot, damp air bursts outward as the pod opens. The interior of the pod is oozing with fluid, drips of it spilling out to dot the floor. A thick coating of it obscures the shape of the person sitting inside until he sits up and stretches his arms. Fluid comes sloughing off in sheets, spilling back into the pod's interior as he rises to his feet. 
There's two wet plots of suction as he detaches the pod's nerve cables attached to his temples. Hi, Yistol. I think that would be how you say his name. I don't know. Yistol towers over me when he straightens up to his full height, the bones of his feet clicking gracefully on the floor when he steps out of the pod. By the way, he is one of the romance candidates. Good morning, Bill. He always talks gently, his voice low. It's a little hard making out what he's saying if the office is ever really busy, but it does make him sound very reassuring, especially when he smiles a little. Diligent as ever, I see. Yeastol leads the way to a table nearby. It's far enough from the pod that there isn't any danger of fluid splashback, which is good. Salt doesn't hold up well to anything wet. And I have a lot of salt to drop off here. My bundle's heavy from the day's worth of salt. And I'm looking forward to lightening it significantly. I start undoing the fabric knot to put the bundle down on the table. How are things looking today? He gives a small sigh at that. Just a warm puff of air that escapes past chitinous lips. <sighs> I haven't spotted any real troublemakers, but there's certainly a buzz in the air. There does seem to be a little crowd congregating just north of here. So I might have to send someone to check it out later. Hopefully it's just a friendly gathering so I can leave it be. I'd hate to have to get anyone in trouble before the eclipse. Hmm. Maybe agree with leniency? Yistol's probably... Actually, hold on. So if I want to get the bad ending first, I think Yistol, Yistol, I think Yistol, um, is deeply caring about people. So probably suggesting action would be our first move when it comes to getting the bad ending first. His bad ending, specifically. I can't help thinking it might be easier for Yistol if action is taken. Wouldn't it be a little easier on you to break them up just in case? Yistol thinks the matter over for a moment before shaking his head. I'll leave it, just in case. I don't want to make cruel assumptions people might feel unwelcome or hurt if I do something like that. Even if I don't quite agree, I can at least understand where Yistol's coming from. He's always mindful of how the community feels, which is admirable. Yistol's job seems busy at the best of times, and I can imagine it only grows more difficult during times of excitement. Like around the eclipse. There aren't very many people who can handle the pressure of being the town's overlook, especially since the overlook pod is apparently a strain to operate. But Yistol's been loved by everyone since he took the job. Highly attentive and quick to respond, he's been key in maintaining the town's peace. Because he's able to spot troublemakers so quickly and send officials to stop them before too much damage is done, it's done a lot to discourage crime. That, on top of being an all-around nice guy, the fabric finally comes undone, and I settle it on the table before digging through my pocket for the note. Alright, it says here that you need 24 packets of salt today, correct? Correct. 24 then. Yistol doesn't eat the 24 packets of salt for himself, of course. As the community overlook, he's also in charge of keeping an eye out for people who are ill or injured or have fallen on hard times. 
anyone who might have difficulty procuring their own salt. These 24 packets will be distributed to such people. That's a little more than usual, right? Is the eclipse causing any trouble? I lay out the salt packets in stacks of four. In a sense... Yistal gives a slightly sheepish laugh. It's not trouble, but I wanted to ensure that people aren't struggling for salt during a time as joyous as the eclipse. I'll be giving out a little extra to people who are having a hard time. My heart warms with admiration. That's really nice of you. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Six stacks of four, 24 packets of salt lay neatly on the table. And I make sure Yistal has given it an approving nod before tying my bundle back over my shoulder. Speaking of the eclipse, do you have any plans? Everyone's so excited about the eclipse. I shake my head. Not really. I might go out to watch it, I guess. Yistol laughs gently. He has a raspy laugh, in contrast to his lilting voice. You sound awfully unimpressed by the eclipse. I guess I'm just pretty satisfied where I am now. I know the eclipse is supposed to be good luck if you're making any big decisions, but I don't have any decisions to make. I shift the bundle on my shoulder and it comes out like a shrug. Maybe if I try taking a different route on my delivery day, I'll find a shortcut. That would be nice. It would make your life a little easier, I suppose. Do you have any plans? There's a pause. Yistal looks thoughtful. A finger tapping at his chin before his lips curve into a smile. I might. I'm still deciding. But, you know, Vil... Yistal reaches out to touch my shoulder. Despite the hard bones of his fingers, the gesture is soft and comforting. Squeezing just briefly before giving a tender pat, then pulling away. The eclipse is really a special time, not just because of the eclipse itself, but because everyone is so excited and happy. I don't think it would be a bad idea to take advantage of that unique energy in the air. I give a small smile. All right, I'll give it some thought. Yistal sees me off. Is it all right for you to leave your pod for so long? It's all right for a few minutes. Taking short breaks helps keep my mind clear. Don't work yourself too hard, even if everyone's depending on you. You shouldn't run yourself ragged. Thanks. You too. I grin. Don't worry. You help me a lot by taking so much salt off my hands. My route's always easier after I've visited you. Yistal rasps out a laugh. Well, I'm glad I could be of help to you. Though I should be the one thanking you for your work all the time. Alright, I'll see you later, Yistol. Take care, Vil. Yistol waves as I start off at a light jog. I wave back. The overlooked tower is docile without him in the cockpit. The towering antennae and mound of flesh just barely quivering. It's strange to see it so calm, which, which says a lot about how much I've grown used to Yistal's constant presence, keeping an eye over the city. He's a good guy. I hope he gets a day off sometime. He could probably use it. It only takes me a few paces to hit my stride. My posture lowering as I transition into my usual gallop. 
With that big delivery out of the way, the rest of the route is smaller deliveries. No problem. Here you go. Thanks. Quick as ever, aren't you? Just trying to be on time. Have a nice day. You too, Phil. Most deliveries go quickly. Just one or two salt packets to drop off along with a brief greeting. For people who aren't at home, I have to drop their salt into the usual delivery box out in front of their door. It's nicer doing personal delivery since I like saying a brief hello to my clients, but it can't be helped. Everyone has things to do. Thanks, Bill. Honey salt, huh? Planning on doing something special for the eclipse? Yup, thinking of throwing a bit of a party. Glad I could get you your salt safely then. I appreciate it. You be careful on your route now, you hear? Will do. Everyone seems happy. It's nice. It's a nice day. My next delivery is a few blocks away. My next delivery is a few blocks away, but I can cut through the park. The ground's a little wetter here. The dirt's solid beneath my feet instead of kicking up into little puffs. My claws dig small grooves with each step, no doubt leaving a little line of tick marks to signal where I've been. They'll probably be trampled flat during the day, only to repeat the next day. The paths in the park are flanked by trees, their gnarled branches reaching haphazardly up and outwards as if they're also looking forward to the eclipse. Small insects lay nestled in the bark, their wings shimmering like water droplets each time they flit around. A few of them chitter at each other, set to the backdrop of crows shouting. Somewhere further away, there's the quiet drone of some sort of factory, belching long streamers of smoke. It's nice here, the atmosphere is great. I really like getting to cut through the park. I'm so distracted that I don't hear the sound of footsteps approaching rapidly. Vil! <laughs> A boisterous pillar of fur and energy comes bursting out of the foliage directly to my right. I jump almost two feet in the air. Hey, Vil! Breton stinks of sweat and dirt, his fur's matted dark in spots, plastered out in strange directions from dried fluids, and there's a glob of something fleshy stuck to his jaw. Hey, Breton, been out all night? Yeah. Just as I suspected. We were exploring out westward since we smelled a lot of salt. Haven't found anything yet, though. God, the music in this game is amazing. I have been enjoying every track. But, uh, I'm sure you'll find it soon. You guys are really good at your jobs. Breton beams at me, tail wagging side to side and knocking around some innocent saplings branches. Breton works as a salt scout. Salt scouts search the flesh fields outside the city in search of raw salt pools. These pools are where we harvest the raw salt for processing at the plant and distributing out to people. An important job, in other words. Salt scouts depend on their sense of smell or sensitivity to changes in the air to seek out the signature sting of salt. So apparently many of them don't mind working during the night when visibility is poor. It's not unusual to see a salt scout heading home in the morning, dirty from a long night of exploring. 
Anyway, even after a night of what must have been exhausting work, Breton talks at a boisterous growl. I thought I smelled you with salt, so I figured I'd catch you now. If I pick up my salt from you here, it'll make your route a little easier, right? A smile tugs at my face. Breton looks terribly proud of this innovative thought. Well, since at the moment I'm thinking of romancing Yistol, I don't think it matters what I respond, but um, let's just say I wouldn't want Breton to wear himself out. It's a sweet gesture, but Breton must already be tired. Thanks, but aren't you tired though? After running around all night? He shakes his head vigorously. A puff of fur drifts off of his scruff to float off into the foliage. Not at all. And I like getting to see you. There isn't an ounce of facetiousness in his voice. It's very charming. Well, let me check what your delivery for today is. Just the usual for me. He pipes up before I can double check my note. So I nod as I shift the bundle on my shoulder to pull out his usual delivery. Two packs of regular salt. Breton tends to eat a bit more than average. Understandable with how much time he spends moving around. Plus he's gigantic, look at him. By the way, he sounds excited. I bet he's going to talk about the eclipse. Do you have any plans for the eclipse? The swinging of his tail has grown ferocious, batting a branch aside with enough gusto to snap it in half. Not really. Everyone seems so excited for the eclipse, which I suppose is the normal reaction. It's probably weirder that I'm more laid back about it, but that's just my nature. Besides, it makes me happy enough to see other people being so excited. Their feelings are infectious. Aw, oh, really? Come on, you should live a little. Breton's enormous paw claps on my back, making me stumble forward a step. One or two salt packets spill from my bundle, but he catches them before they hit the ground. <laughs> Whoops, sorry about that. It's all right. I put those packets away and managed to extract two packets of regular salt in the process. Here you go, the usual for you. Thanks, Phil. For a moment, Breton sounds like he is about to add something, but stops himself. I don't prod, just readjusting my bundle. Sure enough, he shifts his weight from one foot to the other for a moment in a nervous fidget before speaking up again. Also, do you see that cute little blep he's doing? He's so cute. Hey, you know, you really should consider doing something for the eclipse. Well, it's not that I'm against doing anything, but I guess I just don't have any plans. So you'd be up for doing something adventurous? Breton blurts that out loudly enough to startle a crow off of overhead, and I can't help being curious. Maybe. Cool. There's a pause before he hurries to add. Not that I have anything planned or anything. I was just asking. Man, I wish I had a deeper voice for characters like this who probably have really deep voices. But you never know what might come up is what I'm saying. I have to fight back a grin. Breton isn't good at being subtle. I guess you're right. Knowing Breton, maybe he'll teach me about some hidden location to view the eclipse from. He knows this area like the back of his hand. 
thanks to his job. This shortcut through the park is also something he taught me about. So I'd actually be pretty happy if he taught me about some strange new location to visit during the eclipse. It might be a nice change of pace. Anyway, I'll let you get back to your job. Raton is stifling a yawn as he says that. Even his endless energy must be running low after working all night. Sure, you should go get some rest. Will do. There's no warning before Breton leans in to lick my face, his tongue dragging all the way up from my chin to my brow and leaving a sticky trail of drool in its wake. A very moist sign of affection. Do good on your job, and I'll see you tomorrow. And with that, Breton is on his way. I wave as Breton makes his loud exit, crashing his way through some defenseless bushes and leaving a trail of trampled ground in his wake. He waves back as he turns a corner around a prickly bush up ahead, then vanishes from view. It's only then that I raise a hand to my face, considering wiping away the damp tracks lingering on my face. I end up leaving it be. It's not a big deal after all. And my face gets chapped from running against the wind all day. The sheen of spit soothes the raw skin a little. I am curious about this world. Lots of bug creatures, but clearly they're not the only kinds of creatures, and we are most certainly not human. And everyone eats salt. What is that? Anyways, so after one last check of my bundle to make sure it's secure, I turn my attention back to the path through the park. Time to get back to work. Here you go. Thanks, Phil. You're always right on time. I appreciate it. It's nicer to get my salt directly from you instead of my box, you know? I understand. I'm glad I could get it to you, too. You're such a good kid. You take care, all right? Will do, sir. The route grows easier towards the end of the day as my bundle grows ever lighter. I have to stop to tie it tighter over my shoulder, making sure the excess fabric doesn't billow and flap around too much as I run. The deliveries go smoothly. Everyone seems to be in a pretty good mood, and one client gives me a cup of water to keep me going. Though I don't need the water, it's still a nice energy boost, and I thank her for it before continuing on my way. One block has five houses in a row that need deliveries. One house is occupied and I get to hand the salt to my client directly, but the other four are empty, so I leave the salt in their boxes. Maybe they're off at work, or maybe they're making preparations for the eclipse. Hopefully I can say hi to them tomorrow at least. That block done, I trot to the end of the street to the corner, but the sound of screaming catches my attention. Looking up, I catch sight of the small crowd a few blocks down. It takes me a moment of squinting to realize what it is. A punishment salt bath. There's a giant metal tub placed on the ground, flanked on either side by an overlook officer. Oh, and hey, they're kind of like a lizard or some kind of reptile. And inside the tub, salt. And a person. A criminal. Each Overlook officer is holding a capture pole, the wires at the end strung taut around the criminal's limbs, keeping them firmly in the salt bath. Even from this distance, I can make out patches of raw, wet flesh, 
areas where the criminal's skin has been flayed off to expose them to the salt. No doubt the salt in the bath is starting to stain red and clump together from the blood and the fluids. My mouth waters just a little from the thought. These punishment salt baths serve a dual function. On one hand, this is a pretty good punishment. Though larger crimes earn harsher punishments, first-time offenders are usually only given a salt bath. The pain of having raw flesh exposed to salt is usually enough of a deterrent to keep people from repeating their mistakes in the future. And on the other hand, the salt used in these punishments is a bit of a delicacy. Though not as prized as honey or mercury salt, punishment salt has a savory tang to it that almost everyone enjoys. Just enough blood gets mixed into the salt to give it a unique flavor and take off some of the harsh edge to the original salt taste. I'll probably be seeing a bunch of punishment salt to be delivered tomorrow. Maybe I'll claim a package or two for myself. Everyone's talking about the eclipse after all. Maybe I can treat myself. Whoever's immersed in the salt gives a gurgling scream. Sunlight glints off of the bright salt tub. Mmm, let's get back to work. As interesting as this is, I think it would be best to get back to work. Actually, hold on. Stay to watch a little longer. It's a fascinating sight, and I think I can spare a few more moments to watch. The smell of blood intensifies. The capture pole's wires must have dug into a vein. I inhale deeply. The inside of my nose stings a little, as do the raw patches on my face. But I can also feel myself getting a little hungry. If I stay here too long, I might start getting distracted. Maybe it would be best if I got going. I'm still a little distracted thinking about punishment salt by the time I reach the end of the block. I'm at the tail end of my route, and with almost nothing left in my bundle, each step feels light. I drop two salt packages into a delivery box before rounding the corner. Immediately, there's a unique sweetness in the air. Without thinking, I raise my head to inhale deeply. Even if I'm deeply familiar with this smell, it's still enticing. One can't help but breathe in deeper inhales around this area, and there's always a few people loitering around. Up ahead is the bee store. Oh! The small bone chime above the door rattles as I enter. The cages before me buzz in response. The air inside the store is already dizzyingly sweet but the heady scent intensifies for a moment, and I utterly lose my train of thought. Standing before the entrance, I focus on taking in one, two, three deep breaths, each lungful making me feel more languid. You're here, huh? It's a gruff voice sounding from further inside the store that snaps me back to attention. Hey, Niarg, I have your salt. Niarg stands between two tall rows of cages, making notes on a scrap of paper, probably taking notes on the condition of his bees. As I make my way down the aisle, the cages around me buzz happily. Oh. Each cage contains a large, fat bee. Some are shy and turn away as I walk by, but others are more personable and bumble up to the front of the cage to poke their antennae through the bars and wiggle them at me. One cage contains a particularly fluffy bee that waggles its abdomen at me as I approach. I've helped bathe this one before, so it's familiar with me. 
When I pause to poke my fingers through the bars of its cage, it toddles closer and ducks its head so I can rub the area behind its head right where the bristly fur starts to sprout. I pet it a few times, rubbing my fingers in short strokes, and it hums happily in response, licking its wings. Honey dribbles from its mandibles, leaving damp yellow spots on the padding in the cage. Hey there, you're not supposed to be wasting honey like that. Don't blame my bee for that. You're the one who made her drool. Nyarg must have finished taking his notes because he's made his way down the aisle towards me. The bulk of his body towers over me, leaning over to peer into the cage where the bee is rubbing at its mandibles with its frontmost legs. My girls have to work hard these days. You shouldn't agitate them. Oh, right, sorry. You're fine, just don't excite them too much. Got it. The bee continues to wash its face off, antennae flicking periodically. Because of the eclipse, huh? Yeah. Not surprising. Bees are highly prized for their honey. Everyone loves honey salt, after all. Niarg's store sells both bees and honey. Bees are expensive, both to buy and to care for, so not many people can afford to buy one. But saving up to buy some honey for special occasions is much more doable. Maybe I can do that, actually, since I don't have any other plans for the eclipse. Hey, Nyarg? Hmm? Do you have any plans for the eclipse? No. Also not surprising, Nyarg is the type who largely keeps to himself, but I suppose the eclipse should be nice to watch. Right? I'm thinking the same thing. Maybe just taking a relaxing break, watching it happen. Sounds ideal. Think I should buy some honey for the occasion? I do have a few bottles left for today. Hmm. Say you're considering buying some. Nyarg would probably be happiest if I honestly said what's on my mind. You know, I don't do it often, but I was considering picking up a bottle. Since it's a special occasion and all, do you want one now? Not now, I don't carry my wallet with me on my route. Maybe tomorrow? I might sell out tomorrow. But I'll set a bottle aside for you tomorrow if you want. That'd be great, thanks. Nyarg only grunts in response, but some of his lip quirks a little. I think he's pleased. The bone chime on the door rattles as another customer enters and I give Nyarg a quick wave. I better go, actually, but I'll see you tomorrow. Nyarg grunts again, already turning towards his new customers. I give the bees a little wave, too. They buzz back at me, the sweet scent of honey in the air intensifying at that moment. I almost stumble as I turn towards the door, inhaling deeply one last time before stepping outside. My head clears immediately. The air outside is still sweet, but it's nothing compared to the intensity inside the store. Outside, a few people peer into the window, looking at the bees on display there. It smells so good here, doesn't it? Wanna go inside? Nah, I don't wanna run into the owner guy. Why? What's wrong with the owner? I was about to resume my route, but I pause, pretending to adjust the fabric tied over my shoulder. Not that that's even necessary, the strangers don't pay me any attention. I heard he doesn't eat much salt. So what? But he eats something else other than salt. What? I roll my eyes a little. 
Nobody knows, but it's not normal to eat so little salt, you know. And my friend said he once went into the store and they saw him eating one of the bees. Gross. I've heard all that I care to hear, so I finish adjusting my pack and set off at a steady gallop. There are a few weird rumors about Nyarg floating around, and though I once interrupted some gossipy customers, Nyarg told me not to bother in the future, that he doesn't care what other people say. Still, it irks me that people bother making up these silly rumors about people just because they're different. And Nyarg is a good guy. When I get home, I'll look through my savings to make sure I have enough to buy a little bottle of honey. He seemed pleased by my promise to buy a bottle. After all, thanks, Vel. I was worried you might be late, since things seem so hectic today. I'm glad I didn't keep you waiting. You always work so hard, so I know I can count on you. But don't work yourself too hard, you hear? Make sure you give yourself some time off on the eclipse. I'll do that, don't you worry. I waved to the last of my customers for the day, sighing quietly as I turned the corner back onto the main street. The empty pack over my shoulder gets folded into a little cloth bundle I can fit into my pocket. I'll drop this off tomorrow morning while picking up my salt, so my work for today is done. It's not too late when I get back home, but I feel tired nonetheless. Maybe it's the atmosphere, though the walk home had been uneventful. That spark in the air had still been present. It had been like trying to wade through a shallow pool of water. The energy sloughing off one skin in thin sheets with each little conversation with a passerby. Everyone had seemed genuinely excited and I was happy for them, truly. But now that I'm in my room alone, I can't help wondering if it's really fine for me to have no plans at all for the eclipse. I open the window and lean out as I chew on a block of salt, feeling each bite sting at my gums. Outside, the two moons glow past a gossamer curtain of clouds. They infuse the night sky with a gentle light, warding off the complete darkness. And I bask in the cold light as I reflect on the day's events. All of my customers had such different expectations for the eclipse. It sounded like Yeastal had something in mind. Same for Breton. I guess Nyarg doesn't have any plans, but he has to work hard leading up to the eclipse. I finish my salt, dusting my hands off outside, and close the window as I retreat back into my room. Well, I guess it's kind of late to be making any big decisions anyway. And the belief that the eclipse will herald anything good is just superstition. It's a little early to be sleeping, but the day's been weirdly exhausting, and I can feel sleep rolling in like a blanket of fog, steadily clouding through my head. As I sink back into my bed and stare up at the ceiling, I idly consider tomorrow's route. I guess I'm gonna be pretty busy tomorrow, too. Though I start going over tomorrow's route in my head, I can feel my thoughts rapidly clouding over. I'll just deal with things as they happen, I guess. You know what? I think I might leave this here. I had been considering going all the way through Yistol's route, but what I think I'm going to do is leave this as a prologue and then basically do his whole route in another video. So if you made it this far, I want to thank you all for watching. This visual novel is very fascinating, and I hope that you are enjoying it as much as I am. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. And if you want to see more of me, but you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe. I upload videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday as well as extras and shorts randomly throughout the week. I also stream on Twitch, 
Saturdays have been kind of the only constant recently, so if you want to see me live, come on by then. And I hope to see you all next time. Bye.